And we built architectural life and control systems. And these were built with Qt, or Qt, so it's all embedded C++. And uh, you can see these products being used on installations such as the London Eye, and almost all of the bridges along the Thames. Tower Bridge isn't us, and I, I say that because the lighting on Tower Bridge is actually hideous. Um, who are, I think it was a French chap that designed it, um, and it's just horrible. Um, but all of the other bridges along the Thames uh, are run by uh, Pharos. And if you go there with your, your phone, you look for a Wi-Fi, you will find a Pharos Wi-Fi. It isn't encrypted. If you can work out the IP address for the controller, you can start playing around with the lights on all of the bridges. Um, so that's pretty exciting. But anyway, so I've always been a cross-platform developer. And when I worked at Pharos, they said to me, we, we need a mobile app. So the guys at the London Eye, they want to be able to control the lights in the evening from their iPads. Because at the moment, they had to go in and sign into a dusty old PC and pull up a web interface. And they've all got these tablets and phones. I was like, okay, we can make that happen. And I was given the task, you know, it had to be cross-platform, had to be mobile. And the, the lighting controllers had a built-in web server. So I developed a, a web interface using jQuery mobile, and we threw it on the internal web server. And it, it kind of worked. Well, it worked, but it was horrible to use. The, the guys at the London Eye didn't like using it. Um, they said, it looks okay, but it doesn't feel okay because it was just a website masquerading as an app. Um, and I'm, I'm not a big fan of JavaScript. I, I much prefer to work in uh, a statically typed language. Um, I feel most, most at home in Visual Studio. Most at home in Visual Studio. So I was looking uh, one Friday. I spent a week debugging jQuery Mobile. And I was looking for a cross-platform native solution. And I, I, I grew up programming in .NET, so I typed into Google C Sharp iOS. And Xamarin came up, and I pulled out my credit card, and I bought a license to it. And over 48 hours, I hacked together an iOS app, which was 100% native. I'd never built a native iOS app before. So I was using UI table view controllers. I was using UI buttons, all of the APIs that the Objective-C and Swift guys were using. Of course, there you go. It can't get much higher, but it's going to flap. I'm going to put it on my T-shirt instead. Perfect. That's about as close as it will get without me swallowing it. Um, yeah, so where was I? So I built this uh, mobile app over the course of 48 hours, and by come Monday, I had a 100% native app but I was actually reusing 80% of the code. Because most of the code was just calling into this RESTful service. You know, what are the lights currently doing? I want them to go and do something else. And the UI was a very thin layer on top of that. My boss was blown away by this, because well, at first he said, we can't use this. You built an Objective-C app. And I was like, ha ha, one moment, Simon. This is still cross-platform. It's all built in C-sharp. And he was blown away. Um, and I was top boy for probably about a week. And then I handed in my resignation and joined Xamarin. Um, so, hmm. But there are, there are a few ways to architect your mobile apps today, so I just very briefly want to cover those. Um, we call this a siloed approach. So you're going to write your app once in Objective-C or Swift. You're, you're then going to say, right, I want to hit Android as well, because I can't ignore Android. It's such a big platform. So you go ahead and re-implement your entire app in Java and then you ship it into the Google Play Store, and it's a huge success, and then you might want to consider going to Windows. Um, has anyone here written a Windows Phone app? Kind of. Is it in the App Store? If it was, I could have given you a free license. Disaster. Um, yeah, so Windows Phone isn't you know, the most popular for us developers, but actually it's one of the easiest platforms to develop for. Um, which is why I think you'll be interested to learn about Xamarin Forms, because it takes a lot of the approaches of Windows phone development and brings them to iOS and Android. So the problem with this approach is that it's very expensive and time consuming. You're reinventing the wheel for every platform. The code effectively does the same thing, 
but you've had to write it three different times. Um, I've seen lots of companies fall into this approach by accident. Someone said to them, we need to go mobile. So they download Xcode and they start a proof of concept. And you know, maybe the marketing team sees it and they're like, release it. And all of a sudden they've got an Objective-C code base that they need to look after and they're like, okay, that was a success, let's try Android. You download Android Studio or IntelliJ, you write proof of concept and all of a sudden it's in the store again. Um, and then if by some miracle someone says Windows Phone, you've probably already got Visual Studio installed. Um, but yeah, this is, this is a, a pretty expensive and slow way to build a mobile application today. The other alternative is the holy grail of software. This is the idea that we can write once and run anywhere. And this is very prevalent with Qt. So we would write our desktop app once, and we would run it for Windows, Mac, and even Linux. Um, but it never, it never quite looks right. It never quite feels right. We develop primarily on Windows, and all of our Mac users complain constantly that the app looks horrible. And the way that Qt implements mobile strategy is they use QML. Now, QML is, you know, they're rendering everything from scratch. So it's their version of what a button should look like on a mobile. It's their version of what a table view should look like. It's not a native control. The other approach, the other approach is that you go uh, hybrid and you go with HTML5 and CSS. And again, I've, my experience of this is that you deliver pretty substandard products. Um, most end users, it, they won't come out and say, I don't like hybrid, because most of them don't know what hybrid is. But when you look at app store reviews, the hybrid apps tend to perform much lower than native apps. Um, Facebook historically went out and re-implemented their timeline control as a hybrid control. And they took a five-star app down to two stars in one release. And Mark Zuckerberg has said the biggest mistake in Facebook's history was betting too much on HTML5. Now, to me, as a lowly developer, I think if the likes of Facebook can't do hybrid and HTML5 correctly for mobile, what chance do I have? Because they've got infinitely more resources than I do. Um, so this, this approach works really well. I will give it some, some pros. This approach works really well if you've got a pixel-perfect UI that you want to put across every single platform. You've got a design team that doesn't care about platform conventions. Maybe you're building a game, or it's very customized UI that's full on with your branding. Then this approach is going to get you very far very quickly. Um, so 100% go down that route. But if you need to build something that conforms to the platform, that is using the platform controls, then this approach is going to be very difficult for you. So the Xamarin approach, this is a traditional Xamarin approach. We're saying you should still be able to share a whole load of your code. Now, with the traditional approach, we're saying 75% code reuse is about right. And that's this bottom half here. This is a shared app logic. This is your C sharp or F sharp. It's anything that's touching the base class library. It's all the networking, it's all the data persistence, all the boring bits of your app that the user never sees. Then we're going to go ahead and re-implement our UI for each platform that we're targeting using the native UI toolkit. So for iOS, we're going to use storyboards. For Android, we're going to use Android XML. And then for Windows Phone, we're going to use XAML. So that top 25% is 100% native. So the user gets 100% native application, but you're still sharing a whole boatload of code across all the platforms. When you get a bug in your code, Nine times out of ten, you can fix it in the shared logic, and you get that bug fixed for free across all three platforms. Now, we should talk about performance, because that's probably a, a key thing that you're worried about. There's two sides of performance uh, with Xamarin. We've got the iOS, where we have to do ahead of time compilation. Apple is very strict on this. You can't JIT on the device. So we compile your C Sharp to an ARM assembly before we deploy it to the device. So in Visual Studio, when you hit build, we go to IL, just like a WPF or a WinForms application. We ship the IL over to a Mac. Now, this is really important. So you may be using Visual Studio on a PC, but you're going to need a Mac somewhere on the network. And the reason for that is we're using the Mac toolchain to build the app. So we need a Mac with Xcode installed. 
we're going to feed the IL, which we tweak to a bytecode that the LMVM compiler will accept. And the LMVM compiler is the same compiler that a Swift or Objective-C app goes through. So we get the same performance optimizations as an app built with Apple's languages of choice. So there's no performance loss through using C Sharp on iOS. In fact, one of the early Google employees who owns a racing, racing car team, he did very well out of that job. Um, he did some benchmarking. Um, and when you compare straight C Sharp running on iOS to Objective-C, he, he sees, and this isn't us, he doesn't work for us, we couldn't possibly pay him enough money to come and work for us. He sees that the C Sharp version performs slightly better. So it's very marginal. Your users will never notice a difference. But C Sharp versus Objective C, C Sharp tends to be faster. C Sharp versus Swift, Swift seems to be faster at the moment. But as I say, it, it's so marginal that the speed increases that your users will never notice a difference. On Android, things are slightly different. We can JIT, so we do. So we're just going to link and ship over the IL to the device, and we're going to run it in our runtime. So we install our runtime next to Delvic, and then, uh, and then our runtime communicates into Delvic so that we, have, uh, we can communicate straight into native Java objects and get objects back. Um, so when you're, all, when you're doing a debug build for Android, we have a shared runtime on the device because you own that device. It's a debug build. You're, not, you're probably not going to ship a debug build to too many people. And so all of your apps on the device can use that shared runtime. When we build a release build for Android, we're going to bundle in the mono runtime, and we're going to strip out all the bits you're not using. So the same with iOS. By the time your app is running on the device, the overhead of using mono is about 2 megs. So it's not a huge amount of overhead to be able to share all of this code. Um, Android performance-wise, again, we, we tend to see fractionally better performance using C Sharp. Um, if you go to the GitHub port slash Xamarin, you'll see that we used a converter from Java to C Sharp, and we re-implemented a whole host of Android, like huge amounts of Android in C Sharp. And the performance increases were sometimes, you know, two or three times faster than the Java equivalent. Um, so you can go and see the benchmarks. You can go and build Android in C Sharp if you want. It's all on GitHub, and you can see the performance increase. Um, so the key thing to take away from this slide is there's no performance hit through using Xamarin. Your app isn't going to run any slower than the native version. So just like uh, when Microsoft gives you some new APIs, it's built on top of the base class library, which is things like system, system IO, system.link, all the namespaces that we've been using for years. You know, you get some new APIs, you just add these to your existing knowledge of the namespaces and in turn the classes. We've done exactly the same for iOS. So we've got this base class library, which we're going to reuse across every single platform. And then we get a one-to-one -one mapping to the platform API. So anything an Objective-C or Swift developer can do, I can do in C Sharp in Visual Studio. And we did exactly the same for Android. So we've just created a one-to-one -one mapping to every single API. Now, the reason I'm telling you this is because when we talk about customization within Xamarin Forms, you jump down into this level, which is a one-to-one -one mapping to the platform APIs. When you want to build custom controls in Xamarin Forms, you're going to build them using the APIs. It's still all C-sharp, but you're going to be using the APIs of that platform. So you'll be using a UI view. You'll be adding, uh, well, you'll probably be using CA layers in order to do your, your custom drawing in the UI view. And then you would consume that from Xamarin Forms. So what is Xamarin Forms? Well, Xamarin Forms is an abstraction above all three platforms. We've got that one-to-one -one mapping. And we found that all three platforms had very similar controls, which in turn had similar properties and similar events. If we look at a map view, for example, it's pretty safe to say that all mobile operating systems will have some form of map view. But the API, in order to instantiate them, is very different. The properties that they have are very different. We can't just copy and paste our C Sharp from iOS over to Android and have a map view rendered using that traditional approach. So we thought 
we, we thought there's got to be a better way. Um, and so what we've done is we've abstracted away the differences of the platform from you. So in Xamarin Forms, I would say, I want a map view, and I want to display it on the screen. And it's going to say, well, I'm on iOS, so I need to instantiate an Apple map view. I'm on Android, so let's give it a Google map. Then I'm on Windows, so let's go for Bing map. But as a developer, all you've said is, hey, I want to show a map view, and these are the places of interest that I'm, I'm looking for in one common API. So there are some considerations with Xamarin Forms. It's not, it's not great for all kinds of apps. And you're probably wondering, well, what kind of apps can I, can I not build with this? If your app is highly customized, so you, you're millions of custom controls, your design team has a very precise UI uh, look that they want to achieve, you're probably going to end up doing more work with Xamarin Forms to get that customization because this is you know, the higher level abstraction. Because you've got access to those one-to-one -one mappings of the API, you can 100% customize Xamarin Forms to your heart's content. But it's going to be a bit more work than if you've just gone the traditional route. So you need to think about how much customization your app is going to have. Because Xamarin Forms, we're saying, you know, 99% code reuse. The traditional, we're saying 75% code reuse. But if you're doing lots of customizations, your code reuse within Xamarin Forms drops down to about 75%. So you need to weigh up what kind of app you're going to be building. So this is great for data-driven apps. So if you're building the next kind of Dropbox client, or you know, forms over data, you've got some stuff that you want to fill in and then push back to the server, uh, kind of utility apps. This is fantastic for that. Um, and we also support maps, so you could build like a clone of city maps to go with offline uh, mapping support. Um, but you're not going to be building the next Facebook with Xamarin Forms. You could, but it's going to be more work for you. So as I said before, this is 75% of your app. And then historically, we'd do 25% for each platform. Well, now we're saying 99.9% .9 code reuse across all three platforms. And I'd love to say it's 100% you know, code reuse. But when we analyze the solution as a whole, it's always going to come out as 99.9% .9 because we've got a couple of lines of code for each platform-specific project that you need to that platform just to get forms initialized. Now, we'll write that code for you. So you don't have to worry about it. The code you write can be 100% cross-platform. The solution as a whole will always come out as 99.9% in the best case. So Xamarin Forms allows you to quickly and easily build these native UIs. And because it's a native UI, you get the native behavior of that control. And you're able to mix and match forms with that traditional approach. As I said, you can dig down into the lower APIs if you need to. If you want to do some custom stuff for that platform, there's nothing stopping you. You can use AV text speech synthesizer from Xamarin Forms if you wanted. You would just create an interface within your portable class library, iText to speech, and you would implement that for each platform project using the native APIs. So you'd implement it once for Android, then again for iOS, and then again for Windows Phone. And then in your shared code, you just call the interface and say, I want to do text to speech, please and it's going to look within the platform projects to see if it's been implemented and then call that version. So what's included? You get 40 pages, layouts, and controls, and you can build these in C-sharp, F-sharp, or XAML. Do we have any XAML developers in the room? No one? Perfect. Um, so the demo I'll show you will be in C-sharp. Um, because it's XAML, we subscribe to the MVVM approach. Has anyone used MVVM? So for those of you who didn't raise your hands, it's like MVC, but with more Vs and Ms and less Cs. If you've got that down, you've learned it. Um, it's, it allows you to do two-way data binding, which feels like magic as a developer. It gets rid of so much boilerplate code. It's, it's a delight. If you've not looked into MVVM, I highly recommend you go and have a look. Even if you're using Swift or Objective-C, you will find someone has built an MVVM framework for you, and it, it feels like magic. Um, we have a consistent navigation and animation API, as well as a dependency service. 
The dependency service is a bit that allows you to get down to the platform code that you need to. So when you want to dig down into the platform specific code, you use the dependency service to do that. And we've also shipped a very simple messaging center. Now the messaging center allows objects that have no idea about each other, no references to each other to communicate. So I'm building a beer app to track how many beers I drink. Within my search page, I can check in a beer. I can use the messaging center to then go and tell my beer library view that I've added a beer so that you can go and refresh that for me automatically and they don't have to know anything about each other. So it allows you to build very decoupled code to avoid spaghetti code, so it's very nice. I, I was looking at the source code for Xamarin Forms just last week. It turns out it is just one very small class. Very simple to implement, um, but it's very nice. So what do we get included? We get some pages. So we get content, master detail, navigation, tabbed, and carousel. And because this is an abstraction API, things like tabs, on iOS they live at the bottom, on Android they live at the top, and on Windows Phone it's a pivot. But as a developer using Xamarin Forms, we don't have to worry about that. We just say, hey, I want to show some tabs on this device, please. And the OS, because it's a native control, will deal with laying that out for us. But naturally, we have some layout options. Oh, too fast. We'll uh, go back here. Apologies. So most of the time, you're going to be doing your work in a stack and a scroll view. So I tend to throw most of my stuff in a stack view. And then if the stack view is super long, I'll go and put the stack view in a scroll view. Um, the reason I do that is because this is a managed layout. It's going to deal with different device sizes for me. It's going to do a lot of the heavy lifting of how to resize everything. Uh, an absolute layout, I'm going to have to do way more work on the layouts. And when I'm building Xamarin Forms apps, it tends to be proof of concepts and demos rather than fully fledged apps. Um, I like the one-to-one -one mappings myself. Um, but horses for courses. Um, so let's have a look at the controls. And these are the controls that we've mapped across all of the platforms. These are common. And we found APIs that make sense that are common. Now, you may be thinking that I failed to finish the animation or I'm a poor designer, but that gap at the end is actually where you can add your own. So because you've got that access to the one-to-one -one mappings of the APIs, you can build custom controls and add it in. You can go to NuGet and you can add custom controls. So there's a library. Uh, on NuGet, I can't recall what it's called, but if you type in Xamarin Forms, you will find it. Uh, and that adds a whole host, and this is completely open source, a whole host of new controls that have been mapped across all the platforms. And then you can go and buy controls as well. So the likes of Infragistics have made some really nice dashboard controls, which I think are about $1,000. Um, but you can, again, 100% cross-platform, you write your dashboard once and you get it for iOS, Android, and Windows Phone. Which, you know, if you're building an employee app, that's fantastic because you can do a bring your own device and still hit all devices but from one code base. So I love it. Um, so I'm going to show you just the, the default what we get with Xamarin Forms when you create a new solution. Then I'll explain about the layout system and then I'll show you a proper app and we'll build something a bit more exciting. So we'll pull up Visual Studio. Uh, we'll share the screen. I just need to resize this. There we go. So as I mentioned before, you need a Mac somewhere on the network. When I'm doing my demos, I like to just do it on the Mac. Um, I always use Visual Studio but it's much easier to connect to the Mac side of things on the device when at a conference. When I'm at home, this is my go-to device. My Surface is my go-to development device because I control the network. So I know that everything's just gonna work. The network here, everything's isolated. So to have my Mac talk to my PC would be a nightmare. So I just throw it all on one computer and it works perfectly. So 
You do need the Mac for the iOS side of things because of the uh, using the tool chain. You don't need to have the Mac on your desk. What a lot of people do is they buy a bottom of the range Mac mini, they throw it in their bottom drawer, they sometimes stick a Microsoft sticker over the Apple one, and they never look at it again. And it just sits there building the iOS versions constantly. Now, if you are a Mac developer, we have got our own IDE, it's Xamarin Studio. It runs in OS X. It is very much laser focused on mobile. So if you're using IntelliJ or Xcode and you want to go mobile without switching to PC, we've got you covered as well. So when you create a Xamarin Forms project, you, on Windows, you're going to get four projects. You're going to get a portable class library, which is where your app is going to live. And that's going to have, just by default, this app class, which inherits from application. An application has got a property which is main page. And within our main page, we can set a navigation controller, or we can set uh, just a content page. And in this case, we're creating a new content page, and then we add some contents to it. The iOS and Android app will uh, reference this. So if anyone's built an Android app, you'll see that this is that kind of one-to-one -one mapping. So you can see we've got activities. It is just, it's almost like someone's uppercase Java. Um, but it's not. This is actually C Sharp. Um, these are the uh, two lines of code in order to get Xamarin Forms initialized on, uh, on Android. And then if we go into iOS, and actually we're going to be in the uh, app delegate. And we've got the finished launching method, which we've overridden. And then we get Xamarin Forms initialized here. Now, I added a couple of lines, uh, or one line here, in order to get Xamarin Insights added. Uh, if you don't know what Xamarin Insights is, it's our crash and analytics reporting tool. It's entirely free. So any time this app crashes, it, the stack trace is sent to me automatically. Um, so it's just a NuGet package. And as you can see, it's one line of code, and that's ready to go now. So it's a no-brainer for me to add. Do you, do you mind if I ask questions? Yeah, go, go for it. Uh, so I, I assume a lot of this stuff is actually boilerplate code. A, a lot of what you've been showing so far, at least, is boilerplate code that's created when you create a fresh Everything code. you've seen so far, apart from that one line there, is boilerplate. OK. okay. I'm going to just close that. Um, yeah, all I did was I went to NuGet and I grabbed the package just because I wanted to make sure that I had the package ready to go rather than you know, showing you how to yeah, fetch yeah, yeah, a NuGet sure. package. Um, but we still may do that in the uh, main portable class library because I don't think I've added it there. Um, so let's just, in fact, make sure of that. So uh, oh, we didn't want to do that one. Uh, manage NuGet package. We'll do Xamarin Insights. There we go, and we'll install that. And this is built by a team in London. Um, as I say, it's 100% free, so there's no reason not to use it. So we'll set this to start up. And you'll see we've got options for our iOS simulators. If I plug my device in, I'll be able to deploy directly to my device. Um, so there's no limitation there. And we'll just hit Build. And hopefully, the iOS simulator will start running this app. So, sorry, I've got another question again. Sorry. So, so obviously you've got Visual Studio running inside VMware Fusion there, about the looks of things. Yep. Your iOS simulator is logically sitting outside. How are the two communicating? I mean, obviously you've got a VMware virtual network that spans the two. Is that what it's doing? Yeah, so it's using a network. Um, and we actually tunnel into the Mac. Right. So you sign into your Mac account from the PC. Um, and the Mac has all your... your build tools installed. And once you've signed in once, we remember your credentials so that any time you open Visual Studio, we go and look for the Mac for you so that you don't have to manually sit there and connect. It will just connect for you. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, and if you've got the, the phone plugged in, the phone will need to be plugged into the Mac um, in order to deploy to it. Um, so you may want to you know, keep the Mac with a, a cable running out of it in order to deploy. Um, we are thinking about uh, doing USB tunneling so that you can plug in your iPhone into your PC and we tunnel the USB connection from the Mac back to you. Um, but there's, there's no confirmed date. It's probably going to be cycle seven as a minimum, which is probably going to be January at the earliest. So, um, But you can see here we've got the app running on an iPhone. It's not particularly exciting, this. Um, it really is just a hello world. But we can run it on Android as well. 
Um, so we'll set this as our startup. Now, I'm hosting the Android emulator on the Mac as well, and you may be asking, why have I done that? Um, the reason is I didn't want to run a virtual machine within a virtual machine. There becomes a point where it becomes just mad. Um, so I, I thought, you know, I'll run my virtual machine in my host OS, and I will use ADB to connect to uh, the Android emulator on the Mac. So all I did was I went to the, the command line, I typed in ADB connect, and if we come in here and do ADB devices, you can see it's found uh, my emulator that sat here. So I can hit deploy, and hopefully it will just deploy for us. Uh, the first install with any Xamarin Android project normally takes a little longer than iOS because it's installing that shared runtime. Let's have a look at the code whilst it's doing that. Just so you can get an idea for, you know. It's pretty self-explanatory how this works. And actually, we can do this in XAML as well. So I'm using C Sharp because you guys are C Sharp developers rather than XAML developers. But if you want to use XAML, we've got you covered. Um, yeah. And there we go. There's the Android version as well. So it's the same code running across two devices. I would show you the Windows Phone version, but again, VM in a VM is just not going to be good. Um, but rest assured, this works for Windows Phone. Uh, and we're also looking to support uh, UWP apps as well. So you'll be able to go from you know Xbox all the way to Surface to wherever you want to run. If Windows runs it, we'll be able to run it with Xamarin Forms. So it's pretty exciting. Um, So with Xamarin Forms, each page, so you saw we, we created a new content page. Each content page is allowed exactly one visual element. And you're probably thinking that sounds pretty limiting because you know that only means one control. Um, and if you've got, for example, just a list view on a page, then it can work quite well. But if you've got list views and buttons and sliders and other controls, you're going to need to do something. So what you're going to do is you're going to put your controls within a layout. Um, and the layout is going to make sure that it looks great on every single device, and your content of the content page will be the layout that has got your child controls within it. Um, so now you know that. Um, oh, and a bit about the uh, managed and unmanaged. As I mentioned earlier, managed will be stack layout. We do a lot of the heavy lifting for you. Unmanaged is going to be things like uh, the relative layout where you need to define it uh, how to resize and where to move things across all the different devices. So uh, I'm going to build, uh, you can probably kind of see what I'm doing here. I've got Brewery DB library. Um, and Brewery DB is an online service, which you can see here. Uh, it's, it's free to sign up and get an API key with. We'll sign in. Uh, and it's a database full of beers. So I can query into it. I can say, tell me beers, tell me information about Stellar Artois. And it will return a beer object to me with brewery information. Um, and naturally, I've got some keys. So I'm going to copy that, because I will need it. Now, I'm going to add a page. And I'm going to call this uh, Search Beers. Oh, we'll stop it running. Search beers page. We're going to want to inherit from content page. I'll make it public, because why not? And I want to search brewery DB, so I want a search box. And then I want to list view in order to display the results. So I'm just going to do uh, search box, or search bar, sorry. Search bar. List view, and we'll call this beer list. Boom. Search beer page, create the instantiator, and we'll say the title of this content page is just going to be search beer db. And we'll say beer list equals new list view. Now, I don't need to set any properties for the list view just yet because I don't have any data to throw in there. Um, so let's deal with uh, well, let's deal with the search bar.
we'll say placeholder equals search. We'll say search bar dot. And this is why I love C sharp. It's a dot do language. I hit dot and it tells me what I can do. When IntelliSense fails and you know I don't get a list of what I can do, I go to lunch. Try restart the IDE. Um, so I'm going to do search button pressed. Now I want to do uh, an async delegate, uh, but I don't want that to be capital D, thank you very much. Boom. Now within here, I'm going to say var client equals new brewery DB. I'm going to say new brewery DB client, and I want to paste in that key. So no one, no one tweet this key. Um, We'll say var results equals await, because we're not animals, we're going to async await. Uh, we'll do await client dot search for beers, and we'll say search bar dot text. Now we're going to say list view dot uh, item source, or source, mm. oh no, it's beer list, what am I doing? Beer list dot item source equals results. Boom. So I need to lay this out within some kind of layout. Um, so we'll do content. As I said before, content of the content page can have exactly one visual element. So I'm going to create a, a layout in order to put these controls within it. So we'll do new stack layout. And that has a property of children. And I'm going to say search bar. So that's the first control I want. And then I want uh, my beer list. Perfect. Now, if I come to app, I'm going to get rid of all of that. I'm just going to say pages, uh, search page. Now, what I could also do is I could say, you know, I want to try and catch that. Uh, so we'll copy that. Hopefully, that copied it to the clipboard. That did. I can say insights.report, and then I can pass in the exception, so we'll do ex. And now that exception, if it's ever thrown, will be reported straight to me within Xamarin Insights. Now if I got rid of that, and just go back to how it was, if an exception is thrown and it's going to crash the app, Xamarin Insights will catch it and still report it to me. So any uncaught exceptions just get reported, but I can also report exceptions that I'm interested in. Uh, so why don't we run this on Android as is? Now the list view is going to look a bit whack because I've not told it how to display the cells. Um, we're running out of time, so I'm probably not going to do that now. But this is on GitHub, so you can have a look. It is extraordinarily simple. There we go, look, we've got search. So I'm going to do Stella. In fact, let's just do the cells. We're only doing real beer. So I moved to Belgium for seven months um, because I'm such a big fan of drinking beer. Uh, oh, something's gone. Var cell equals new. Data template will say type of text cell. We're going to say set binding, and this is the data binding. We'll say text cell dot text property. Uh, oh, text property. There we go. And we'll say name. Now you're probably wondering how it's working out, what the name is to display. But it looks at the item source, and it looks at the type, and then it's going to look for the property name that matches what we've set as a binding. So it knows that beer is the type that we're going to be displaying in this cell, and it says, well, beer's got a property of name, so we'll just grab that. Um, and now what I can do is beer list dot, I think it's a data template, or template, item template equals cell. So we can redeploy this. Let's 
Stella. There we go. And then we've got the list view there. We could, let's go and see how this looks on iOS as well. Now it's worth noting with iOS you always want to make sure before you ship to the App Store that you've tested it on a real device. The simulator has access to all of your resources on your computer. So this has got 16 gigs of RAM and the, the new iPad Pro only has 4 gigs of RAM. Um, so just to say I would fix this by putting this in a navigation page which would give us a navigation controller at the top. If we had a bit more time I'd show you how to do that but you, you get the idea. Um, so it's 100% code reuse, and I've just built an app that's querying, you know, a database. It's using a RESTful API. It's fetching it. It's parsing it down into an object that I can reuse. I'm using this same library, this Brewery DB library, in Azure as well. So I'm building a proper beer tracking application that's going to use machine learning to make predictions about what beers I should try next. And I still want to be able to query Brewery DB. So I just took this existing C Sharp, threw it up into the cloud, and it works with Web API. So this is a beauty of C Sharp. You know, I can go from running it on my Apple Watch all the way to Azure and anything in between. There's almost not a platform that C Sharp can't target. So it really is a cross platform language. Um, so if you want to learn more about Xamarin Forms, um, Charles is writing a book for us. Um, it's uh, free to download. Um, you can also get copies of it uh, if you hang around the Xamarin office, um, which is based in London. They have just moved, so I don't know where they've gone to. I work from home. Um, but uh, yeah, you can grab that uh, from Microsoft, or you can grab it from our website as well, which is xamarin.com. Um, you can go onto my GitHub. You can find the completed projects of this. Um, so you can download that and have a play with it. Uh, it's got all the dependencies all ready to go. Um, my colleague Pierce has already has also written a Snapchat clone entirely in Xamarin Forms. So you can do, you know, take a photo, draw on it, and then send it to your friends. And again, that's using Azure as a backend with blob storage. Um, it's got custom authentication, 100% Xamarin Forms, and he sees about 80% code reuse with that app. Um, Again, because he's using, you know, drawing on the camera views, you, you really can't do that in a cross-platform fashion. You have to drop down into the platform APIs. Um, so you can see how to implement custom renderers. Um, I'm building uh, Beer Drinking, which is a beer tracking app for Android and Windows Phone using Xamarin Forms. So if you want to uh, have a weekend project or you want to see an app being developed from start to finish, then just email me, mike at xamarin.com. I'll add you to the repository. I haven't made it public just yet because I need to invalidate some keys before I publish it to the world. Um, but I'm happy to add people on an ad hoc basis so that you can see how, how it's being developed. Um, so any questions? I've got one. So you said that you maintain kind of sort of 100% currency with the APIs, the sort of the standard APIs that you get on iOS and Android and so on and so forth. I guess the inevitable question is, if you look at something like, I don't know, iOS 9 coming out, obviously, which, you know, just the other day, yep. how quickly does Xamarin as a tool or as a company kind of react to that stuff? Have you kind of got insight into those APIs ahead of time? You've already got Xamarin ready to go? Like, what's, what's the time? It, 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 it depends on what Apple's releasing. Um, I, I can't really talk too much because we have NDAs. Okay. Um, but to give you an example, TVOS was released or announced just last week. Uh, on stage, they were showing off one of the apps which was built using Xamarin. Right. So that should say enough. Um, in terms of new OS releases uh, from Apple, we normally get them dropped on us with iOS the same day that you get them. But it's normally about two weeks before we've got bindings ready for you to use. Um, so Apple give you enough time before it's dropped into the laps of end users. Um, so you know, I've already iOS 9-ified all of my uh, existing apps. And the beer drinking app that I'm building right now uses the search APIs, which is using NS user activities. 
which is publicly indexed. So now, you know, if you search for Stellar Artois in Siri, using Siri or the OS, it can bring up beer drinking and take you straight to that app. So, you know, that's a brand new feature. There's not many apps that are doing that already. Um, and because we support the APIs so quickly, uh, we're able to just add that. And that's the story for Apple, but I assume your story for sort of um, Google and Android. Android's even easier. Android, uh, so they came out with Android Wear, and uh, our CTO said, they released it in the morning, and our CTO said instantly on Twitter that we plan to support this within the next six months. And then by that afternoon, we had a release ready to go. So and Android's much, much easier. Um, I, Apple, Apple were difficult because they, they make so many changes, like Bitcode, for example, huge, huge amount of engineering that's had to go into supporting Bitcode uh, with our existing tool set. Um, we can do it, it just takes us a bit longer. Um, so, okay. any other questions? Okay. Uh, I use Java. Uh, I'm not a C sharp developer, so I've done jQuery, mobile. Uh, in my company, uh, one of my colleagues used Code One. So, my question is this. Because uh, you said that for that Xamarin is very good for utility app, not for how that needs a customization, customization. So my question is this: What is your advice for someone like me now that I am not a C# user, and if I want to go to Xamarin, and you know, what are the chances that I have? You know, is it a good idea for me, for my own background, now, okay, to use? Well, if you already know Java, then you're pretty much, you know, an expert in C Sharp version two. Um, so C Sharp, you know, is more advanced language than Java in many respects. Um, but the languages are so so similar that you're not going to struggle to pick up C Sharp. Um, certainly, you'll have to learn some new APIs. But if you've built any Android applications using Java, then your Xamarin Android experience is going to be top notch. It really is just a almost a case of uppercasing a few bits and you're good to go. Um, you, you can start to add new features, you know, you can start using async await and lambdas and generics and all the fancy lovely stuff that make me love C sharp, but you don't have to. When you're getting started you can just keep your existing knowledge of Java and pretty much bring that over to C sharp without any problems. The difficulty with learning mobile is learning the APIs which is the benefit of Xamarin Forms, that we're saying three platforms, one API. But if you already know the Android APIs and you already know the iOS APIs, then we're saying, you know, you've got the experience to build mobile apps. Let's just share more of your code. So, I have a question about the Xamarin Forms. Um, I understand how the architecture of your app kind of fragments and consolidates for platforms. So for iOS, let's say I wanted to use NSURL session to make use of background multitasking. Um, does that not fragment the uh, use of the C sharp system IO libraries and things like that by going around with uh, worse code architecture because you're fragmenting and consolidating at various different points up and down? Sure. So if you want to do background tasks in iOS using Xamarin, you'll just want to use the standard async await or tasks. Yeah, you would just use the .NET approach. And then when you want to call back to the UI, you would just say, I want to invoke this on the, on the main thread. And that uses the No, it uses the Xamarin implementation of. So we've, we've got the .NET approach to doing backgrounding. So you know, if I want to go and fetch some data and not look, lock up the UI, yeah, but does that um, also work in the iOS background? So yeah. So any, any code that is being executed uh, in, in Swift and Objective-C, we can then execute in C-sharp. So if we're using the standard .NET approach rather than Apple's APIs, we can still execute that uh, in, when your app is running in the background. To give you an example of an app, you can go and look at the code for it. Microsoft built an Uber clone called MyShuttle. 
Um, and that works where you can go and request a driver, close the app, but it's still going to be tracking the driver's location, your, your location in the background. And that's entirely built with C Sharp. Um, it's end-to-end -end C Sharp. So you can go and explore the different approaches. Um, but rest assured, you can absolutely do background tasks using Xamarin iOS. Cool. Well, thank you very much.